This is a Wonk's Paradise. Uh, as you get, for better or worse, you get a, a, a three social scientists in a row. Um, but I know it's just before lunch, uh, and uh, so and uh, I want to uh, be sure and um, uh, uh, take advantage of, of your uh, remaining energy as efficiently as possible. Uh, I think my remarks are going to be as serious as Martin's and David's, but there are going to be a lot fewer words on the slides um, and uh, a bunch of pictures. Um, this is the first time I've, I've given these remarks, but I've been thinking about these questions for some time, and I'm, I'm very eager for your, for your feedback. Uh, per my question earlier with Dennis, uh, I actually presume that most of the capital that's going to be required to transform uh, uh, the evolution of, of teaching and learning is going to be private capital. Uh, and uh, my great conviction is that uh, universities like this one should take leadership uh, in helping uh, both the educational world, but also um, governments all over the world come to terms with that fact and create conditions under which private capital can demonstrate that it is responsibly invested in civic and economic prosperity uh, for the people that it is serving. Um, and uh, this is what I'm giving a few slides today on is, is, is a, a current, uh, the, the current state of a, maybe a five or six year thought project. Um, I'm gonna take as given uh, uh, per earlier discussions that more frequent occupational and life transformations are inevitable for essentially anyone living on the planet who seeks to engage in re remunerative employment. I'm gonna presume that more economic uncertainty and competition, that there's gonna be more economic uncertainty and competition for relative advantage in an increasingly competitive capitalism, both in the United States and worldwide. It's gonna be frowny face for a minute, but there will be a smiley face in a moment or two. Um, and I am going to presume that there's going to be a growing supply of lifelong learning educational credential opportunities, a great proliferation of new ways of both, of both learning and demonstrating that one has learned. And indeed, one of the great pleasures of being uh, in Northern California at this moment in history is that there's so much organizational and technological fertility um, in, in uh, providing new forms of, of teaching and learning. Um, and here's the optimistic part. Um, California, for, you know, I, I, I moved here from New York City, and I know that all stories have to end uh, in, a, in a happy way in California. Um, I was cynical about that for a while, but I, I also have come to see that it's essential to our region's identity, um, that a sense of creativity and, um, uh, and forward thinking is really um, uh, an important asset of, of this region and a, a great many of the wealthy people in this region. Uh, and uh, I, wanna, I wanna be facing this complicated future that you've been hearing about all morning with a smiley face and a question mark, all right? Um, I'm going to also presume, um, along with, uh, with David and uh, Martin, that we're gonna be looking at a plural capital streams, um, a, plur a more plural public-private ecosystem uh, for teaching and learning going forward. I do not take as given, and this will be resonant with some earlier remarks that you've heard, that there's gonna be a shared understanding of the dramatic changes that are taking place in our economy and our world. And indeed, if we needed a reminder that there is not a shared understanding about the American 21st century, uh, all we have to do is, is look at the elections in November of 2016, uh, which is why I think events like this are so important, coming up with a shared understanding. I do not presume that equitable mechanisms for maintaining employability will be around in the future, and in this I, sh I very much share uh, Martin Carnoy's conviction. Uh, and I do not assume, take as a given that there will be a reasonable distribution of information and risk in markets for lifelong learning. And I'll make that clear in just a moment. I'm gonna talk primarily about this last, the bottom right-hand bullet. All right, so um, you know, one, of, one of a few things on which sociologists and economists agree, the US post-secondary system is a market. It's been a market from in, in, in various forms uh, since its earliest inception uh, for all sorts of interesting reasons that I won't talk about today. Um, uh, but we have, depending on how you count, 4,500, 5,000, 5,500 colleges and universities in the United States, several hundred in the eight county Bay Area region alone. You haven't heard of most of them, but that doesn't mean they don't exist and they're not fiercely competitive uh, for, for students and revenue and that they're not being subsidized by the state and federal governments. Um, uh, th there's a categorical tiering of this system by admission selectivity and institutional wealth and prestige. That's been true since time immemorial as well, 
but the stratification regime within higher education has only gotten steeper in recent decades, so that the, the relative distance between extraordinarily wealthy and highly selective schools like Stanford and essentially the rest of the sector is growing. I think that's a large uh, uh, ideological problem for a lot of us as well, who, who like me, would, would, would like to see the most well-endowed um, and most research-intensive schools being of service to the rest of the sector, but we're becoming less and less like each other with each passing year, so it makes collective action more difficult across the sector. Uh, this whole system is, as Martin and, and David suggested earlier, it is substantially and diffusely subsidized by government. Um, uh, higher education is, is an essential part of what uh, many historians call the American hidden welfare state, right? We subsidize higher education elaborately in the form of tax exemption, student loans and grants, federal research, state legislative subsidy. You're sitting in one of the most spectacular government accomplishments of the United States 20th century. Now, we at Stanford often don't like to think that way. We like, to presume, we like to emphasize our relative autonomy from government, but make no mistake, every palm tree, every blade of grass, every water polo player is underwritten directly or indirectly or both by the state of California and the United States federal government. And to me, that means that Stanford's researchers and students and leaders have a special responsibility to make positive, critical contributions to the evolution of work and learning as a joint, I will suggest, civic and private sector project. This market is driven by substantial, uh, govern organized around substantial information asymmetries between suppliers and consumers. All that means is that the people who typically consume educational services don't know very much about the quality of what they're presuming. I have a little ache in my side. I'm not sure what it is. I took an aspirin. I went to bed early, but it didn't work. I think I'll go see the doctor. The doctor tells me I have appendicitis. Ooh, glad I asked. Would you mind cutting it out for me in the next 72 hours and charge me whatever you like? And I'll thank you afterwards, right? A medical exchange is, a, is it one clear example of an information asymmetry in which I'm a one-shot player in getting an appendectomy. And so I enter into a commercial transaction um, uh, hoping that I make the right deal. Um, uh, but, but I have to trust that the person on the other side of that deal is being responsible. Now, so in other words, higher education is a, is a peculiar information ecosystem. Um, and markets are no mere technical affairs. They're also deeply cultural and sensual and even emotional. Um, the first time I went to, uh, the only time I went to, to Turkey, I visited the Grand Bazaar in Istanbul, um, uh, which is, 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 is one marketplace that has been elaborately written about by social scientists um, and uh, artists um, over, over many generations. And it really is a spectacular place. These aren't my photos, I just got them off the web. Um, but it uh, really is a, a, a miraculous, I mean, a, a, quite a magical um, uh, interactive experience. And it's full of people like this. Uh, who are very skilled in the art of explaining to you just why that particular piece of fabric is unlike any other fabric you are going to find in the market. And he'll, he'll tell you that you're the first customer of the day, which is good luck for him, so he's going to make a very good deal with you. Um, and uh, uh, in fact, he has, he has built a whole way of life around making sure um, uh, uh, that you think that he, he is a trustworthy and has access um, to, to the best information. Um, now, there are good deals to be found, um, and in fact, um, you know, the, uh, one way in which you can find one is, is you could hire a guide, a personal shopper for the day, to help you with insider knowledge um, um, about, uh, um, about exactly which booths one should peruse and just exactly how much that pair of leather sandals um, should cost. So that's one kind of market with which you may be familiar. You may be more familiar with this kind of market, right? Um, this market has some connection, some ancient relationship to this bazaar, except as Robert Venturi and Denise Scott Brown, the architects, brilliantly pointed out in their book, Learning from Las Vegas, instead of the sights and smells of the product themselves and the people who are performing their quality, it's the packaging of the boxes that does that 
courtship for you. Um, and of course, just the packaging is a multi-billion dollar industry, and it too is tiered for different kinds of, of consumers. Um, and, um, and, 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 and retailers fight fiercely for those middle shelves, right, for the sweetest, sugariest cereals, right? You know exactly why, right? Um, I want to suggest, what is my next slide, that I may ask a, a counterfactual. If we do nothing to create a responsible, lifelong learning marketplace, if we do nothing, what kind of marketplace will we probably get? I want to suggest that we'll get some combination of that and that. You know why I think that? Because that's the market for post-secondary teaching and learning that we currently have, right? On the left is the trust us, this is an exotic product. We've been honing its quality for hundreds of years, right? Only the most expert artisans will train your son or daughter at X university. Come visit, see how beautiful it is, right? Talk to our advisors and faculty members, right? And pay up, because we promise you it's a high quality product, right? Can you think of any universities that function like that? All right? And then there's a whole other side of the market, which it has invested primarily in advertising, right? To get at, to basically take David's American dream idea and like just kind of drill it into your heart, right? At the commercial breaks, right? The University of Phoenix is spectacularly skilled at this. Even I shed a tear when I re watch some of the University of Phoenix's commercials. Um, uh, and, 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 and all of this is, as, as Dennis said earlier, effectively unregulated. And so this market asymmetry is really shaped um, in large measure by, by either long-standing traditions of exoticism, right, um, um, or, or, or slick marketing, or, or let's just say some combination of the two. What might a less asymmetrical market look like? Well, I just bought a car recently, and I won't, I won't show you this, because then you'll know how much I paid for my car. Um, um, but in fact, in, in the automobile industry, a great many mechanisms have been established to reduce the information asymmetries um, between buyers and sellers. So even while there's a lot of exoticizing and hawking, of, of this product, there's lots of other information. Instantly, I can find out um, what the federal government says I can expect for gas mileage on the window of the car. Instantly, I can get a government five-star safety rating right, right there on the window. Um, uh, and I don't have to even go to the dealership, actually. I could read consumer reports. Uh, I, could, I could buy a certified pre-owned vehicle. I could read the automobile press for reviews. I could use Carfax. Um, or, or I could just buy the car on, online and, and, and compare it. You know, we don't have to visit the, I wouldn't have to go to the showroom, right? Um, now, if a lot of this sounds familiar, it should, because the basic insight um, was developed uh, 50 years ago um, by who was then a, um, uh, a, a Berkeley uh, economist named George Ackerloff, right? This isn't rocket science, right? We can create responsible, information-driven, transparent environments uh, uh, for, for lifelong learning opportunities, but they're not going to just fall out of the sky. We're gonna to have to engage in concerted, patient, persistent, dogged, public and private action to create the responsible learning marketplace we want to have. Thanks. Thank